I have now seen Tenet three times. The first time, I enjoyed it, but I didn't actually have a clue what was going on. I found it very difficult to follow, and I left the cinema feeling pretty stupid. What the f was that? So I went home, and I made a video saying how the movie makes no sense, and was pretty much unenjoyable. Then I went to see it a second time. This time, I left the cinema feeling pretty happy as this time I was actually able to get my head around most of the plot. And it was at this point that I went on the Wearing Hats Saying Things podcast to share my thoughts on the movie with the boys. What's the Wearing Hats Saying Things podcast I hear you ask? Well, it's a podcast hosted by Connor and Ronan. They do podcasts both with and without guests, covering a wide range of topics, and recently I was lucky enough to be a guest on their channel. So if you want to hear us talk for an extended period of time about Tenet, or anything else they've done episodes on, the link to their channel will be in the description. After this podcast was recorded, I decided to go and see it a third, and for now, final time. And I left the cinema feeling unenthusiastic. So I decided to scrap my original video and make this one. I did say after my first viewing that it'd take a few watches to enjoy, so let's see if my theory is actually true. Let's start off with the bits that I do like. We've got some lovely casting. John David Washington kills it as this movie's protagonist, the protagonist, and all round legend Robert Pattinson slays the part of Neil. And those two together on screen create some fantastic scenes and it's a pairing I really enjoy watching on screen. If you can get past the blinding cliche of a Russian supervillain complete with a thick accent who says lines like, if I can't have her, nobody can, then Kenneth Branagh is pretty enjoyable to watch. It's taken me a while to warm to him as such an evil character, and I thought from the trailers that we were going to have a Jennifer Lawrence-style Russian accent. Americans always think the rest of us are so interested in you, don't you? But he is mostly enjoyable to watch, even though I'm not very sure he'll be a very memorable villain. Also, Elizabeth Debicki, uh, a great actress, and she did very well portraying Kat in this movie. Well, as well as she could do with what she was given. I think out of all the characters, Kat is one that I have the problem with the most. But I'm still trying to list positive things, so I'll get back to that a little bit later on. Other than the cast and performances, we have some amazing choreography. Actors had to learn to walk backwards for scenes where some people were going forwards in time and some were travelling backwards. Overall, it was technically a very impressive movie. Also, I should mention the score. Nolan's go-to music man, Hans Zimmer, was busy working on some little indie film called Dune. So Ludwig Göransson had to step up to the plate for Tenet. And I think he's done a great job. He's made a really memorable score, even if it did drown out the dialogue because of the questionable sound mix in the movie. All of these things are great, and they make up for some absolutely fantastic scenes. But that's where my problems begin. It's not very coherent. It's just a bunch of cool scenes tangled together in a really uncomfortably quick-paced movie. The pacing between these scenes is just too fast. For some reason, it feels like not much happened throughout the entire film, even though the movie is two and a half hours long. It feels sort of stripped down and bare, and I think that might just be because it's too fast. Nolan has made the point of filming all across the world in the footsteps of the Bond movies, but characters jump from place to place with so little breathing room that even on my third watch, I struggle to keep up in parts and you don't get any time to take in the amazing countries that they shot the movie in. Within these fast-paced scenes, we have Nolan's classic walking down streets explaining things to the audience, this time with Neil describing how they'll break into the art gallery in the airport. Now, this plane that they crash in order to set off a fire alarm is an example of something the movie does a lot, which is prioritise spectacle over story. I find it very difficult to believe that a big plane crash was needed to lock down that art room from the inside. I think a small bin fire in the corridor would have done the job just fine. And the plane isn't the only example of unnecessary spectacle. I'm also still asking myself, why did protagonist need to fight himself at the airport? When I first watched that scene, I thought it was great. You get really carried away when you realise he's actually suddenly fighting himself. But after a few watches, now that I've digested the movie, I don't understand how the version of the protagonist who was inverting backwards didn't know that he was going to fight himself. He's travelling backwards in time to the location where he was a week ago, at the exact same time, to a room he knows his former self will be in. He approaches it wearing the exact same clothes and pretty unique face mask and helmet that his attacker from the week before was wearing, and doesn't come to the conclusion at any point that he was actually about to go in and fight himself. We see in the rest of the movie that characters have unrealistically high IQs and can keep up with everything, so how did he not figure that out? And I know he gets blown into the room accidentally, 
But is there really any point of that scene where he fights himself, really? With or without that fight, they manage to get Cat through the inversion machine, so it does just feel like it's there for spectacle. Concentration on spectacle seems to cause lapses in what could have been a good story, and still has me asking questions about the mechanics of the universe of the movie, instead of metaphors and meaning behind the movie which I still think about when I watch other Nolan movies like Inception. In my opinion, the complexity of the script causes the movie to trip up on itself, and once you understand the movie, it doesn't actually make it more enjoyable. For example, I now understand that Neil was saying about the grandfather paradox, which on the first watch, mixed with a million other things fed to you at a million miles an hour, is an interesting idea. But now that I've actually thought about it, I feel like you can't really make a plot about something that's a paradox, because it's a paradox. So when he's talking about people in the future wanting to kill people in the past in the hope that doing so wouldn't destroy themselves, it just seems like nonsense. Why on earth would anyone say with confidence that destroying the past won't also destroy the future? Doesn't really make any sense. Also, the complexity adds contradictions which are pretty obvious once the confusing dust of the movie settles. For example, a very important factor in the movie is that to the protagonist and the Tenet guys, there aren't many known inversion machines. When Cat gets shot and protagonist wants to go through inversion to save her, Military Man Ives says to the protagonist something along the lines of, where are you going to find an inversion chamber a week ago? We only just secured this one. Which clearly suggests that to those guys, there is a real lack in quantity of inversion chambers. But at the end of the movie, when they need lots of people going backwards in time for a big exciting battle, they just have a bunch of these inversion machines. On a ship. So where do these all suddenly come from? Ives bumhole? You can probably break it down and say, ah well, people in the future sent them. But then it just creates more questions. And using the future people did it excuse is just lazy. Speaking of bumholes, what happens if you do a poo before inversion and you forget? Does it just come back and undigest? Does it come out again as food? These are some serious questions that the movie just doesn't answer. Right, we're going to have a little break now, as it's time for the Movie Surgeon Awards. Now there is only one award, uh, it's going to be a very short ceremony, but it's a prestigious award nonetheless. I am of course referring to the most useless and irritating female character in a Christopher Nolan movie. And the nominees are Cat from Tenet, Rachel from The Dark Knight, Dr. Brand, Interstellar, Sarah from The Prestige, Dead Wife Mal from Inception, the girl murdered before insomnia even starts, and Leonard's murdered wife in Memento. Drum roll, please. And the award goes to... And there's no surprise here, it's Cat from Tenet. Congratulations, Cat. You've surpassed Mal from Inception, who's won this award for the last 10 years. It really takes an awful lot to beat a woman whose character is nothing but a whiny irritant who plagues her husband's life even after her death. Congratulations, Cat. You were literally written like a damsel in distress from a movie in the 1930s. Do you have anything to say for yourself? Yes. Thank you. What an honor. It has always been my dream to be a character who literally does nothing but whinge and whine and receives both verbal and physical abuse from her cliche Russian husband. Nothing beats being a character who is spineless and pathetic spends most of her time being scared or recovering from a gunshot wound, but also manages to complain about her son, a small boy whose face the audience literally never sees, continuously, irritatingly, and unnecessarily to the point where the audience just wants to die. Cat's awful storyline is woven into the movie and is impossible to ignore. By the end of the movie, her character was extremely grating. At no point in the movie do I care at all about her son, but she constantly brings him up as if the audience knows anything about him and has any reason whatsoever to care about him. Her only motivation throughout the entire movie is being an abused mother, which is just boring. And I'm paraphrasing here, but at one point Neil says, the weapon will destroy everything on earth that has ever existed in one second. And she says, that includes my son. Yes, it does. That includes everyone's sons. Just shut up. Soon after, Neil puts her to sleep with a sedative, at which point the audience breathed a sigh of relief. It just confuses me because Nolan's wife produces all of his movies. Does she not say anything at any stage? Like during the script writing stage or anything like, hey, these characters are crap. 
The end of the movie has been a big talking point amongst viewers. For me, the entire ending sequence was just a bit of a mess. First of all, again, we have a contradiction. Beardo, who's in charge of Red Team, says something along the lines of, will have the benefit of their experience, whilst referring to the blue team, as the blue team started some time ahead but moved backwards in time. So the end of blue team's mission was at the beginning of red team's. Therefore, they would know what was going on in the battle and they'd be able to relay information to the red team so that red team could go into battle with knowledge of any potential obstacles. But that just seems to go out of the window from the moment he stops speaking about it, as they don't actually seem to speak to Blue Team or gather any sort of information from them that would help. Such as, maybe, I don't know, that there's a tripwire in the access point two guys from Red Team will be going down to complete the mission that they're all there for. Yes, Neil who's from Blue Team sees the tripwire and sees it go off and saves them at the last minute. But surely if he had just stuck to the brief and got to the end of the battle and actually given the Red Team the information that they needed, they could have just sorted that whole situation. Also, there is this huge battle. The Tenet guys literally have two armies, one going forwards in time and one going backwards in time, but there only seems to be about five Russian guys just dotted around in a couple of buildings, and there's literally hundreds of Tenet guys. And even on the third watch, the amount of people going forward and backwards and blowing up different things is just way too hard to follow. Instead of learning from the blue team, everyone just piles in on a big old shootout and I can't really tell who's doing what. Everyone is in matching uniforms apart from a little coloured armband on their arm, which are very hard to see. Then we get to the final bit where Beardo, protagonist and baldy Russian guy, and what's implied to be a future Neil, are all fighting over the algorithm underneath before the bomb goes off. But there's like three guys in identical suits and masks in a dark chamber with one moving backwards in time. If you can keep up with that, then well done. At the conclusion of the battle, we find out that it was in fact the future version of protagonist who was hiring everybody and was in charge of the whole mission the entire time. I feel like this was supposed to be a big reveal, but I just thought, right, okay. After a third watch, I can fit this together with a bunch of other things that happened in the movie, and I guess it helps the movie to make a bit more sense, but I just don't really care. The fact that he is actually in charge of the whole Tenet movement isn't actually very exciting, because the movie has kept so much information about protagonists from us, even down to his name, that you just think, sure, I guess that could make sense, and you feel nothing. I said after my first viewing that if you strip off the inversion stuff, the plot to this movie is just two guys trying to catch a bad guy and succeeding pretty easily. Now, after a third time watching, I stand by that. I can understand the film a lot better, which is nice because I feel less dumb, but what you actually realise is that what Nolan has done is he's managed to take a cool idea and a basic plot and write it and paste it in a way that's extremely difficult to understand and follow for absolutely no reason. After a third viewing, I'd still say I enjoy my experience watching this movie, but there isn't really much in it that makes it worth at least three viewings to understand. And once you do understand it, you realise that there isn't actually much to it. The channel New Rockstars did a great video breaking down the plot, which actually helped me to understand the movie a lot better. You should watch that. Go and tell them I sent you. But should I have to watch a 15 minute YouTube video breaking down a movie and see it at least three times in order to enjoy it? Is a movie that takes weeks to digest and pick apart automatically bad? I'm not sure. I'd just say that now I think overall the movie was way too complex for its own good and sort of shot itself in the foot, but there are still some parts of it that really can be enjoyed. What are your thoughts? What do you think? Let me know in the comments. Also, if you haven't already, make sure to subscribe and turn on the notification bell so you can see more juicy videos like this. Thanks for watching. See ya. Bye.